proposals were put forth supposedly to import natural gas. Uh, and what we discovered in researching these processes, these projects, was that it really wasn't about import at all. It was about destroying our regional gas markets and turning it into an international gas market. Mm -hmm. Gas in the United States sells for today around two to three dollars an mm BTU. It's a unit of measurement. That same gas in Asia will sell anywhere from fifteen to twenty dollars wow. an mm BTU. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. Today, our guest is Paul Sansoni. Uh, Paul is, the founding, is a founding member of Oregon Citizens Against the Pipelines. Uh, they work with the Columbia Clean Energy Coalition, whose members include BARC, Columbia River Keepers, the Oregon Chapter of the Sierra Club, the Oregon Chapter of Food and Water Watch, and Greenpeace, and others. So uh, welcome to the show, Paul. Thank you. Great. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself before we get into the conversation. Well, I've been in energy and the energy industry my entire life. Um, uh, I um, helped write uh, the comprehensive plan for the city of Forest Grove and did the early energy planning for the state of uh, Oregon under CRAG, under the Columbia Region Association of Government, which was before Metro. And I went on to found several solar companies, um, uh, Solar Resource Service, and we did the very first um, solar workshops in Oregon where we trained unemployed people to weatherize and solarize elderly people's houses to reduce their energy bills. Oh, I and we did community workshops where everybody went away with plans and the capability of doing it themselves. And that ended up involving into a very large company called Onsite Energy, which was one of the largest private power companies in the world at the time. Uh, we built alternative energy plants all around uh, the planet from biomass plants in Haines, Alaska to uh, remote windmill sites for the Navy up in Alaska. Um, enormously successful business. So successful that uh, our funding uh, was uh, yanked and we were dismembered and it became Enron. It became uh, that huge uh, monolithic company that ended up uh, manipulating energy markets and uh, going bankrupt. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Enron owned Portland General Electric. They bought Portland General Electric and uh, they bought uh, most of the projects and my staff and, uh, and went heavily into speculating in energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, uh, so that's my energy background. Okay. Yeah, just, just as a, a reminder for people or, or for young people who might be watching who haven't really heard of Enron, talk a little bit about Enron and their history and what well, happened. Well, en Enron, this is it's so ironic because Enron started as a gas pipeline company. And uh, they realized that the money was really in speculation. And uh, they evolved into a very, one of the largest companies in the United States, a major backing of, uh, of Bush, of the, uh, of the Bush senior uh, presidency, and uh, also of, uh, of the Bush Cheney administration. Um, and they pushed heavily for deregulation. And uh, the, the effect of that was a massive increase in the cost of energy for the everyday citizen. It didn't decrease the cost of energy, it did just the opposite. And uh, so that was the beginning of this energy era that we're in right now. Okay, all right, great. So r recently you wrote a letter to Bill, McFib the Mc Bill McFib McKibben uh, with 350.org. And could you just describe that letter and why you wrote it? And well, what we're trying to do is reach out to the different activists that are active in, uh, in trying to stop the Keystone Pipeline and that are concerned about uh, uh, the climate change I issues. And what we wanted to, to bring them up to date with was the fact that the tar sands development and the Keystone Pipeline depend upon fracked gas. And fracked gas is, uh, 
is gas that is in unconventional deposits, uh, like tight deposits, they're called shale deposits, and where in order to free that gas, they have to drill down, do horizontal drilling, and then inject chemicals into these, into these drill bores and fracture the formation, and it's called fracking. And in the process, they, they free up that gas. It's an enormously damaging environmental process with literally hundreds of millions of gallons of polluted water that are created through this process. Uh, you can't have tar sands development without frack gas. And the, how this is important for Oregon is that we were, uh, we have fought and won. Uh, we have st uh, stopped three LNG terminals and four pipelines in, in the state of Oregon. And these proposals were put forth supposedly to import natural gas. Uh, and what we discovered in researching these processes, these projects, was that it really wasn't about import at all. It was about destroying our regional gas markets and turning it into an international gas market. Mm -hmm. Gas in the United States sells for today around two to three dollars an mm BTU. It's a unit of measurement. That same gas in Asia will sell anywhere from 15 to 20 dollars wow. an mm BTU. Costs about five dollars at MMBTU to ship it across the Pacific. Huge profit margin. So this industry convinced Congress in the 2005 Energy Act that we were in dire need of, of more energy. And so they passed this act that allowed them to expedite the, the siting of these LNG terminals, supposedly for import. Mm -hmm. And they had over 60 proposals for these terminals, and these terminals are huge. We've, the one that was gonna go into Warrington would have been the single largest industrial development in Oregon's history. Well, and that's up by Astoria, and at, Astoria. The, at, the, at the mouth of the Columbia River. Right, these right. are not small projects, mm -hmm. these are huge. One tanker, one tanker can carry off 10% of the U.S. production of natural gas, one tanker. And and uh, I'm sorry, U.S. production of natural gas during a in year a, or a, uh, in a day. In a, a, a yeah. day. Okay. Literally. Okay. So there. So ten, ten tankers could carry all of our all production of off offshore. Right. Okay. And they're talking about, and they were had proposals for up to sixty of of, of these these uh, these import terminals. Mm -hmm. um, what we found in our research was, uh, and they approved. There's five of them that were approved and built, to the tune of two to three billion dollars each when you count the pipelines and everything that goes with them. Not and in Oregon, elsewhere not in the country. Oregon, mostly okay. in the Gulf Coast. Mm -hmm. None of them have ever imported natural gas. Mm -hmm. And when we analyzed the projects, we found that the pipelines going to these import terminals were larger than the terminals. And when we followed the pipelines, they went to the shale gas deposits. Mm -hmm. So in further research, we found that the, the technology for fracking was developed by a federal fund through the Department of Defense to Halliburton. Halliburton in the late 90s, early 2000s developed this technology. So they knew before the 2005 Energy Act mm -hmm. that they were gonna be creating a huge bubble of natural gas. And uh, they wrote into the law exemptions from the Clean Air and Clean Water Act and the fast tracking of these terminals. And I like to call it weapons of mass deception. Just as we were tricked into going into Iraq by the weapons of mass destruction, mm -hmm. we were tricked into building this huge natural gas infrastructure under the uh, precept that we were short of energy when in fact they were creating a huge bubble. And why this is so important is that this huge bubble of natural gas is going to kill the renewable energy industry. We're now in our th what I call the third extinction of the renewable energy industry in the United States. The first extinction happened in Southern California in the 20s when Southern California Edison killed uh, a, a blossoming solar um, industry that was building water heaters. And uh, they flooded the market with natural gas and gave away gas water heaters. As a matter of fact, day and night water heaters 
mm -hmm. were actually a solar company when they first started. Mm. And now they're the largest natural gas water heating company. The second major extinction happened after the oil embargo. When oil went to way above $100 a barrel. This was in the 70s? 70s. Mm -hmm. okay. The, natural, the uh, renewable energy industry blossomed. Um, I was a part of that industry. Mm -hmm. um, President Carter put President solar panels Carter. on the White House. Solar panels mm -hmm. on the White House. We did these workshops where we trained unemployed people to be solar installers. Uh, the industry was growing by leaps and bounds. On-site energy was a great example of how fast this industry could grow. And um, the Texas oilman, led by Herbert B Bush, mm -hmm. went to Saudi Arabia and said, you realize that you're killing our industry? That the longer that oil stays expensive, we will create the industry that will destroy us. And they colluded to flood the world market with $20 a barrel oil. And that and Ronald Reagan stripping away the, the uh, tax credits for renewable energy, taking the collectors off the, uh, off the White House, we turned back the clock and we killed the industry a second mm -hmm. time. And now this third time, it's happening again. And that's my message to people, is that we need to wake up, that we could have a renewable energy-based society yesterday. I live in a solar house mm -hmm. that's 30 years old. I just got through rebuilding my solar water heating and space heating system, uh, rebuilt them. They're ready for another 30 years. So our choice is whether we invest in renewable energy that will free us and free our economy, or do we continue to be enslaved, really, to these gas and oil interests. Mm -hmm. Okay, talk a bit. Talk a bit. A bit about uh, Bush, Cheney, and Halliburton, and the connections. Well, in early in the Bush Cheney administration, uh, they convened what are now called the secret energy meetings, and um, we have been unable to get. Um, the written records of those meetings. The Supreme Court ruled that uh, through executive privilege, they're allowed to keep that private. Executive privilege on the part of the administration. On the part of the right. administration. But what we do know is, is by going back and looking at the research, we know that they developed fracking and they knew it was going to work in 2000. In the 2005 Energy Act, what the Bush-Cheney administration did was they, they exempted fracking from the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. And they took away the right of states to site the LNG terminals and they gave it to FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Mm -hmm. And basically that was to fast track these proposals. And so they, they eliminated environmental oversight into the fracking industry and they fast tracked these import terminals uh, all under the 2005 Energy Act, all under the, uh, under the assumption that we were short of energy. And this, was, uh, this, is, a, this is fraud. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's apparent fraud. And it's something that needs to be investigated. Um, uh, that we would expend, and what's happened now is that there's hundreds of thousands of fracked wells. That, that, that have happened under the radar. Mm -hmm. If you go to... Um, I'm sorry, what, when you say under the radar, you mean just without our real conscious awareness? Co or conscious awareness of it. They're not like secret, but we're just not talking about really well, the public not aware of it. The public isn't aware of it, and but in individual communities where they've been impacted, they are aware of it. Mm -hmm. And and in the beginning, they said this would be a clean industry, that it wasn't going to pollute. And, but then you, you've you seen the uh, different pictures on the internet where they light the water. Uh, yeah, um, where the, the, the movie Gasland. Gasland, where the, where the methane is has escaped from these frack wells and gone into drinking water. Mm -hmm. Well, um, there's also enormous air pollution that happens. If you go to northern Colorado and southern Wyoming today, the air in that area is dirtier than Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. This is an area that, you know, when I was in high school 40 years ago, I went and was a ski bum in Colorado. And the most brilliant blue skies you can ever imagine. And you go there today, and it's like L.A. Basin. Mm -hmm. It's that smoggy from all the fracked gas that's, that's, that's leaking from these wells and from the compressor stations and the rest of it. Um, uh, we're creating huge water shortages. Pennsylvania, 
uh, incredible amounts of pollution where they take this frac fluid when it comes back up and they have to dispose of it somehow. And they, uh, they found that this is radioactive, it's full of carcinogenic chemicals, and they've been dumping that into rivers or putting it through municipal waste treatment uh, plants that aren't really equipped to handle it. Mm -hmm. So, um, and now it's being touted in Washington like this is the savior, mm -hmm. that now we have all this natural gas. Matter of fact, we have so much, we need to export it. Mm -hmm. And if they're allowed to export this gas, our prices will quadruple. Why would they sell the gas to us mm -hmm. for 2 to $4 an MMBTU when they can get 20 for it in Asia? So um, under the auspices that we have so much that you know, President uh, Obama said in his State of the Union address that uh, we have 100 years of natural gas. Well, that's, you really have to question that. If five years ago they wanted to build 60 import terminals because we were supposedly short on natural gas, mm -hmm. how can we believe the industry today that we have a 100-year surplus? Mm -hmm. I don't think we can believe anything. Yeah. And when, uh, w when he said that during his State of the Union address, my thought was, wow, 100 years, that's all? That's all. It's really a short period of time, although, you know, as we think about it, it's a long time, but it really is a short period of time to say, uh, you know, when you have the ability to construct energy sources that are forever renewable, then why would you focus all your energy on developing one that's only got, a, you know, at most, uh, in the rosy scenario, 100 years? Right. Right. And most people, they, they keep talking about natural gas being a bridge to renewable energy. Well, a bridge is also a beachhead in military terms. Mm -hmm. Once you create a bridge, you've also created the, a beachhead. Where, and that's really what's happening. We're not going to have renewable energy development until we turn away from fossil fuels. Every dollar that we invest in fossil fuel development is a dollar that isn't going towards renewable energy. And there's a myth that we can't do that today. And, and it's just a myth. When uh, President Kennedy said we're going to land a human on the moon in 10 years, we did not have the capability, the rocket, to be able to put a human uh, on the planet. And even if we had that rocket, we didn't have the capability of talking to a human mm -hmm. uh, uh, on the moon. But because we focused and made that a national goal, we developed those capabilities. And my father happened to be part of the military industrial complex that developed that. And as a kid, I remember him bringing home lasers where we would be able to talk to a satellite and develop those type of technologies. We are much further advanced in energy production technologies than we were ever in, in the space race. Mm -hmm. If we decided today that we were switching over to renewable energy, we could do it. But instead, we're going to do this bridge technology, which will just kill that entirely. And that's what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. You can see the, the solar industries are under attack. Mm -hmm. The, uh, you know, we've got even our, our largest solar uh, collector manufacturers are near bankruptcy. Uh, we're pulling back all the subsidies from renewables. Meanwhile, the most heavily subsidized s energy source is, are the fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. If you track the amount of subsidies that we subsidize the research that develop the technologies, we give them uh, drilling credits, we give them accelerated depreciation on their equipment, we give them tax breaks on, on where they locate their facilities. We give them the right of eminent domain to condemn other private businesses in order to get their right of ways. It is incredibly subsidized. But then they talk about Solyndra failure or a, a couple other renewable energy failures when really the, the boondoggle, the, the, the massive amount of waste is uh, is in the natural gas and the oil industry. Mm -hmm. They estimate that if we just charged for the national defense cost for defending the oil lines to, to, to get to the United States, that gas at, at the pump would have to be $10 a gallon. 
wow. if we folded in those costs into mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So what we've done is hidden all the subsidies to the fossil fuel industry and then made the renewable energy uh, subsidies very, very visible mm -hmm. and very, very prone to attack. And so what we see just as Reagan Bush killed the solar industry back in, uh, in the 80s, we see the same thing happening again. And uh, people need to wake up. We need to contact our senators, Senator Wyden and Senator Merkley, and demand an investigation into this apparent fraud. We need to demand our attorney general in Oregon, Ellen Rosenblum, to investigate the lies that Oregon LNG has told Oregon legislators and uh, property owners. And this continues to this day. We were sent letters from Oregon LNG saying we are no longer on their pipeline route. We, we've heard you because all the farmers and forests, we organized and we went up against FERC and up against Oregon LNG and we stopped them dead in their tracks. So they sent us a letter saying, the pipeline's no longer coming through your valley. And then when we read the two inch thick proposal to FERC, mm -hmm. buried in there was our pipeline. Hmm. Now it's a alternate route. And under FERC procedures, they can switch back to that route like that. So the these companies have no compunction at all to say whatever's necessary to get approval. But if you and I lied like this, mm -hmm. we'd be in the jail so quick. You, imagine if you went and got a building permit for your house and said that, you know, that it was for a use that was completely different than what it was. Mm -hmm. They'd be on you like this. Oh, uh, absolutely. But a $2 billion facility mm -hmm. in Warrington can lie, and I don't want to sugarcoat it. I mean, the lawyers will say, apparently use false and misleading statements, but in English, that's a lie, uh -huh. uh, in, in order to get these things approved. So we need to wake up. We need to realize that, uh, that we're enslaved to fossil fuels just because we're ignorant of the fact that we don't have to be. Okay, so you, you wrote this letter to Bill McKibben. Uh, did you get any response from him? Um, unfortunately, uh, the, their first response was, we don't, have, we don't have the legal dollars to prosecute this. And, and in further discussions with them, I said, well, you're advocating civil disobedience. You're advocating disinvesture, that, that we no longer invest in these companies. We need to be equally forceful to the fact that we're dealing with criminal enterprises mm -hmm. and that it really doesn't take legal dollars on their part. It's the government's responsibility to, to investigate this. So they, they didn't really understand uh, what the request was. The request is that we reframe this discussion, that we are in fact have been duped, conned, cheated, and we need to bring these people to justice. Um, the Sierra Club has been actually more receptive, National Sierra, mm -hmm. Sierra Club, and of course our state uh, Sierra Club has been very active in stopping LNG proposals. Sierra Club voted for the first time in its history to use civil disobedience. They have never advocated civil disobedience. And so they realize that the regulatory system and the legislative system has been completely corrupted by the amount of money that we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And so they're saying, we have nothing left but civil disobedience. And so they are looking into what legal options we have as citizens to force our government to, to investigate this. Mm -hmm. So some of it is just trying to bring it up onto the radar. Mm -hmm. And some of it, the problem is, is that people don't understand the history. Mm -hmm. and, and I lived through this history. Um, most of my contemporaries uh, were older and have died. Um, they haven't got rid of me yet. <laughs> <laughs> you seem like you have a lot of energy, so oh, yeah, that's good. I'm not going that's anywhere, great, yes. <laughs> voluntarily. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, so um, a last quick statement about what people can do, not necessarily just in Oregon, but, uh, but uh, nationwide. Nationwide, we need to call for an investigation. We need to quantify what our natural gas reserves really are. And we need to get rid of all the above uh, uh, philosophy on developing energy and go to nothing but renewable. We can change, we can do it yesterday, and we need to demand our elected officials to do their job and to investigate, which is obvious fraud, 
and, and collusion and racketeering and to get us on a proper course. Great. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. All right. Great. Great. So we have been talking with Paul uh, Sansoni, uh, who's a founding member of Oregon Citizens Against Pipelines. So I want to call your attention to two upcoming events in Portland. Uh, first, the progressive radio talk show host Tom Hartman is going to be back in Portland for a public event on Friday, April 26th. Tom is author of over 25 books on a variety of topics. He is Unequal Protections, The Rise of Corporate Dominance and the Theft of Human Rights is one of the most important books written on the history of the development of corporate power and to my knowledge the only one which addresses how free trade agreements are the most current effort by corporations to dominate decision making in both the United States and world worldwide. Tom is in Portland at the First Unitarian Church for a public presentation promoting the 28th Constitution Amendment to end the corporate created, excuse me, the court created doctrines of corporate personhood and money is speech. The event starts at 7 p.m. The church is located at Southwest 12th and Main in downtown Portland. And if you live in Salem, Tom will be in Salem on Saturday, April 27th at 1 p.m. at the Grand Theater at 191 High Street Northeast in downtown Salem. The second event is brought to Portland by Move to Mend, the national group which advocates both for a democracy movement in the United States as well as a 28th constitutional amendment. They, they have organized a series of grassroots democracy convergences during 2013. One will be here in Portland during the weekend of May 3rd through May 5th. Location will be at Portland Community College Cascade Campus. More information and to register, go to movetomen.org slash 2013-convergences. Populist Dialogues is now on YouTube. Go to youtube.com and search for Populist Dialogues. Click on the result with the Statue of Liberty icon to view all our shows this year and to subscribe. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end a corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. Learn more at our national website at thealliancefordemocracy.org or at Portland website at afd-pdx.org. We want to thank our volunteers who donate their time to get our program on the air. Again, we want to thank Roger Bates, Dave King, Janet Morris, Lori Sutton, Tom Thomas, and Brad Leach. And I want to thank all of you for watching. Thank you. I hope that we'll see you again next week. Bye.